Um, the, the work that I'm going to talk about today has is, is really been undertaken from an industrial perspective. Um, I've had a, a, a very vast and uh, nicely blessed career. I started out after graduate school working for the U.S. Navy, developing lasers for some of their aircraft. Then I was teaching at the University of Maryland, so I've had government and academic experience, and then I left uh, after several years and went to a startup in the United States to develop crystal growth technology for many of the laser companies that are uh, developing lasers globally. Uh, I was there for 18 years through three acquisitions till we became a part of 26 Incorporated. Uh, at that point, I was doing a, a lot of work with public policy and trying to direct research initiatives for both academic and industrial surroundings. And the whole time I was working on transparent nanopowders and transparent laser materials. Uh, I left there in uh, 2010 to take over CEO for a laser company in Seattle and I've been doing consulting for the last two years and working as a board member free of charge, all volunteer for the Optical Society uh, to work with student chapters and to try to um, inspire the next generation of, of great academic and industrial scientists. So my talk today is gonna focus a little bit on that aspect of it as well, but primarily gonna focus on laser materials, polycrystalline based uh, from nanopowder science through ge next generation lasers. The outline, as you see it here, is really to discuss motivation of this topic. Uh, single crystal versus ceramic materials, which have the advantage. Development of nanopowders, which has really been critical over the last 15 years. Mechanical characterization of these materials, laser test results, future directions both in laser and non-laser applications, and conclusions. Now just so you know, as, as I said, you know, one of my missions is to talk to scientists that are working in STEM and in, uh, the various aspects of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, especially those that are looking to be entrepreneurs, to go into business, to go into the industry side, but as well as academics. Um, and, and one of the main things that I wanted to impress here that's come through some of the talks already this week, and I, I want to reiterate it here, is for the work that you're seeing in my presentation today, it's coming out of an industrial setting. It's coming from a company where they worry about profits, where they worry about getting a product to a customer, and where they worry about uh, publications and patents about third down on the list. The real focus is, can we make something that someone is going to buy, and how do we do that competitively? And what you'll find is if you do go into an industrial setting, or if you are an entrepreneur coming out of school, one of the greatest things that you need to understand is you may be the world's leading expert in the field in which you're working, but that doesn't encompass everything that you've got to do to make something work. And, and that's where understanding that cooperation and teamwork and, and building uh, a network is really critical. And that's where organizations like OSA and SPIE and other professional organizations that you may become a part of really do help paved the path for your career. Uh, my career started setting up an OSA chapter 30 years ago this year. And from there it was networking and working with young students and then working with publishers or uh, as editors on journals and then other scientists. So understanding that network routine is really important for being able to advance your career globally and being able to potentially lay down a path that you want to follow. Um, so right here, one of the quotes from Helen Keller is about doing something together. You've really got to understand that you're not going to know everything about every topic that you've got to address. And if you don't know it, admit it. Find the person that can help you the best and bring them in to be one of your teammates on what you're working on. And secondarily, knowledge isn't the key for what you're doing and the, the, everything that you've been presenting here the last three days. It's really more about imagination. A lot of the work you're doing here is spectacular, and you've got to keep the imagination going. Book knowledge can only carry you so far. Drive and imagination are really key aspects in a young career. So the partners that you're gonna see in the slides I'm presenting today are people that I've worked with the last 15 years, and it's not just physicists and it's not just chemists. It's everything from crystal growth scientists material scientists, electrical and mechanical engineers, the chemists, thin film engineers, uh, solid state physicists, laser scientists, mathematicians, polymer scientists, nanopowder scientists, 
all of them spanning university industry and government. And that's been the way that what you're going to see in a minute is this technology really started evolving in the late 1990s in the solid state laser arena. And the reason that it's accelerated and, and made something happen in the last 15 years is because these teams were able to come together and understand there was one major goal, and that was how do we get from point A to point B with a very scientific method, but in the most rapid way possible. And realizing that nobody's trying to take anything from anybody else, but to work collaboratively and to come up with a plan for the research. Some of my partners here, I won't go through them all, but they're from University of Central Florida and Stanford, uh, Nano Xerox, where I advise, US Army Research Lab, Konoshima in Japan, Naval Research Laboratory, uh, Adolf Giesen, one of the, the most famous uh, laser scientists in Germany, uh, universities like Clemson, uh, Dr. Zhang used to be at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. I started working with him about 10 years ago. He's now heading up a group in Singapore. Gary Messing is the head of the material science department at Penn State University. Uh, Dr. Akesue, who's uh, the pioneer in this field, really. And then two of my colleagues at 2.6, uh, my first graduate student that graduated with her PhD under me, and then uh, John Dumb. So as I mentioned previously, I really want to show the motivation. Why have we as a laser community gone from gases to glass to crystal to now polycrystalline materials? And what difference does that make? How does that impact both the uh, financial side as well as the uh, scientific side? So from a historical perspective, most of you that have studied optics know that the Ruby laser was the first solid state laser demonstrated. Uh, Charles Towns, who we just lost this year, was one of those founders. Uh, it used a helical arc lamp, a piece of synthetic ruby, two polished mirrors, applied the voltage across that arc lamp, turn, tweaked the laser, turned it on, and it worked after uh, some work in the lab. Very rudimentary, but it was the first step down the path from maser to laser. The real limiting factor here was using flash lamps which are just like the flashes in your camera, put out an awful lot of light in the spectrum and only a very small niche of that light is used to convert to laser photons. Because of that, everything else is thrown away in the way of heat or non-radiative decay in the materials. Besides Ruby, there was an evolution in other crystalline materials over the last 30 years. A lot of work coming out of uh, the groups in, in, in Hanover, the groups in Russia, the groups in the United States and Japan, in growing single crystals. Neodymium YAG, the purple one here in the middle, is probably the largest consumed laser material globally. There's about $35 million in sales annually of that material. The other materials around it are undope YAG, cerium YAG, and, and erbium YAG, which is used in medical applications like the dental applications that were presented this morning. There's also other materials like yttrium vanadate, which has grown very heavily in China for small telecommunications-based lasers. And when you talk about you know, the largest single crystal neodymium YAG, if you look at this, this is um, right at 100 millimeters across and about 250 millimeters in total length. You can see where laser rods have been cored out with a diamond bit. There's also slabs that have been cut from here. The chemical formula, the neodymium ion, resides on the yttrium ion site. It's a garnet cubic structure. The neodymium, as I said, replaces the yttrium in the lattice. However, there is a challenge in that the neodymium ion is larger than the yttrium ion. So as you grow these materials, um, you're depleting your melt and it doesn't want to squeeze in there. Over 250 millimeters, the concentration from one end of this material to the other will vary by about 30% uh, because of that distribution coefficient. Um, challenges with this material, to grow something like this takes about 40 to 60 days. It grows at about 1,970 degrees, plus or minus one degree centigrade over that entire 40 day period. So your furnaces, which are RF based, have to have a tremendous amount of thermal stability. Something as small as a glitch in the power for two seconds, a lightning strike, the air conditioning shutting down in the room, all of those can turn this into a very pretty purple paperweight that can't be sold because it just sucks defects into it when the temperature starts to drop rapidly. Um, you can't get much neodymium in because of the distribution coefficient. 
and they have to be grown at almost 2,000 degrees, which means most glasses and other materials can't hold the powder in a molten state. So you're using iridium, and this iridium is about this big around, it looks like a paint bucket, and it costs you about three quarters of a million dollars for each bucket that you buy. My previous company, we had 25 growth furnaces, so we had about 28 of those buckets. So it's a huge investment from a corporate standpoint to try to buy the material just to grow the, uh, the ag in. A couple of the challenges are, if you look down the length of the, of the material in an interferometer, when these are growing, they're growing with an interface. They're also growing with high stress regions. You can see here at every 120 degrees, there's a high stress point in the interferometry. All of this is useless material because as you propagate the wave front of a beam through there, you're gonna distort it and it's not gonna come out with a clean mode. You also have very high uh, stress in the very center. So if you're trying to fabricate wide slabs or large pieces of material, you have three small pieces of pie here, if you will. Typical yield with a crystal like this is typically 50 or 60% at best. So you're making all this growth, you're investing all this time, you're consuming kilowatts and kilowatts of power over these 40 days, and you're throwing 50% of it away at the end. It can be done, but that impacts the price of what you see from Coherent and Spectrophysics and, and the laser companies that are here. So it is a, a challenge. You can get decent wavefront out across a, a 10 millimeter area, but it's tough. This is what the bulls look like if you cut them lengthwise and look at a Schlieren interferogram. Because these grow down into the melt with an interface, that interface is mimicked as you pull the crystal up and rotate it, just like growing sugar candy as a kid. So these areas can cause there to be defects in the laser, which then give rise to either radial or tangential distortion components of the wavefront propagating down the rod. In the 1970s, uh, many of the federal labs uh, went to trying to develop glass lasers for inertial confinement fusion. They thought that they could grow bigger pieces than they could get with a single crystal, so they went from four inches in diameter up to a continuous melt that you see here that's an uh, extremely large cross-section piece of glass. Here's the first glass laser uh, up here in the top left photograph from 1961. Uh, the only problem with glass, as everybody knows, thermal conductivity is horrific. So if you're going to run anything at a very high rep rate or there's gonna be a lot of thermal load, the glass is going to start to break down or limit the operation of the laser. So if you look at things like the laser that's in France or the, the precursors to the Eli system or the Lawrence Livermore uh, systems, those were taking one shot every 60 seconds. So you'd have a pulse, and then you would wait a minute for everything to cool down. And then you'd have another pulse. It's not a very rapid way to do your research. I can't imagine doing a thesis on that laser. So it would take you forever to be done. So your four years would be gone before you know it. So and when I was working with the Navy, late 1980s, early 1990s, we started moving away from flash lamps because Sony and Spectre Diode Labs and many other companies were starting to develop high power diodes. The beauty of the high power diode is it had a fairly narrow spectral output, which could couple very well to the absorption lines in the rare earth or the transition metal ions. For neodymium, you could pump at 808. For the ytterbium that we heard about earlier today, you can pump at 940 and lays between 1030 and 1050 nanometers. The good thing is it took laser efficiencies up from about one-tenth of 1% 1 wall plug to greater than 30% today, uh, which, is, which is reasonable. It also took laser output powers in 1987, the highest output power recorded was about 100 watts. Uh, today it's well over 100 kilowatts. So it, it's made advancements in the laser industry come about very rapidly over the last 25 years. And, and it's primarily due to this quantum defect, the calculation of you know, the, the driving factors, the difference of the energy of the pump photon and the energy of the uh, lasing photon. You pump at 808, you laze at 1064. Here you pump at 940 nanometers, you laze at 1030 nanometers. And the beauty of that is this is about now an 80% efficient, quantum efficient transition. For neodymium and something like YAG, it's more on the order of 60 to 65% efficient. So this is your absorption and your emission cross-section 
spectra for a terbium and YAG. I saw some papers and posters earlier today that uh, students were measuring this. So you pump right here at about 940 where the peak of the absorption cross section is for a terbium. You see the absorption tailing down here. Here's the peak of your emission coming up top here. The thing that you note, absorption and the emission overlap down here, so you don't have a true four-level laser. It's actually a quasi-three-level laser. And the way that these lasers work most efficiently is you use what's called photon bleaching. You pump with so many diodes that you drive more than 50% of your electrons out of the ground state to the excited state. And when, you, when that happens, you no longer have the ground state absorption. So you're now moving into the phase of being a quasi three level or quasi four level laser instead of a pure three level laser. You get rid of those losses and make it a much more efficient system. So when you see people talking about neodymium YAG systems, it's usually 1% neodymium in YAG. With the terbium systems, it's usually at least 10% of terbium because you want that massive absorption that you can then drive out of the ground state. So next transition was from single crystal to ceramics, but why go to ceramics? Why, why was this move made? I interesting history here. Konoshima Chemical was one of the leading drivers along with Dr. Akesue, who was affiliated with one of the universities in Japan as well as World Ceramic, which was a, a two-man operation. Back in the uh, late 1990s, Japan was driving to really try to be the leader in UV-based photolithography. And they had YAG coming out of Hitachi Mining and out of several other companies that was being grown single crystal. But as you saw from the picture, in order to get below 200 nanometers, fifth harmonic, as we saw with one of the posters yesterday, that means you start with 1064, then you do second harmonic generation to 532. Probably throw away 50% of your energy there. And then you go from 532 to 266, and throw away another 50%, and then from 266 down to, to 208 or, or 193 nanometers. Very, very inefficient process to get into the sub 200 nanometer region for photolithography for electronics. But Japan wanted to be the leader, so they said, how are we going to get large pieces of YAG to start with kilowatts at one micron so that we have 100 milliwatts at the end coming out at 193? And the folks at Konoshima and at World Laser said, let's try making polycrystalline material. Let's try making very large cross sections and see if we can do it. So Japan infused over $20 million into each of these companies over a three year period as part of their OIDTA initiative to try to be the world leader in, in the uh, UV based uh, development of mask for photolithography. So that's where these guys started. And it took them about 15 years to get to the point where they actually had a commercial product, and Japan had already given up on the photolithography drive by then. But the initial seed money made a tremendous difference here by funding two small groups to compete head to head, and both of them came out very successful with it. So uh, I think in terms of a return on investment from a business standpoint, Japan has to look back and say, that was pretty good. So the definition of a ceramic, or a polycrystalline material, you'll hear them called both. It's a rigid body consisting of an ionic material that's manufactured from a powder through a variety of consolidation and sintering techniques. And these techniques do not require a phase change. If you're growing single crystal, you have to go through phase changes to get it into the phase that you need it. If you process the powders properly, you don't have to worry about that as much. These show some of the early crystals that were being manufactured, very small, translucent, transparent in some cases, but not very clean. One of the things I want to start with here, and I'll come back to a similar slide when we get towards the end, is if you look at polycrystalline materials and, and what the roadmap looked like, there were two or three papers back here, in a t three papers actually in a 10-year time frame uh, that looked at neodymium and dysprosium doped materials that researchers at Bell Labs and other locations thought that they could manufacture via transparent sintering versus single crystal growth. Um, that was it, and then you've got this dead period here for well over 15 years without a single publication in the scientific literature. And then in 1990, the case away comes in and starts looking at neodymium YAG. And then in 95, Konoshima finally starts publishing. Uh, I think both of these had initial publications here, and then the Japanese government clamped down, and then it started to accelerate. Uh, in 2010, 
on transparent neodymium dope materials, there were 450 peer-reviewed papers that year alone, and it's just continued to climb like this. So they're now looking at alternative host materials. It's become a very interesting research arena, but as I showed on the first slide, it's one of those research areas that you really have to have breadth in. You've got to have material science, you've got to have spectroscopy, you've got to have physics, laser engineering, chemistry. You have to have this whole toolkit or have a really good team that has solid efforts in all of those areas. The Caseaways group really worked at simplistic lasers. They weren't going with high power to begin with. They took 2.5% neodymium, they bonded it to a single piece of potassium niobate, had a one watt diode, two lenses to make their cavity, and boom, they had a green laser and they had a blue laser, depending on the material. For the green laser, they used a, a KTP crystal here. But that was 2006, and these were a few milliwatts of blue and green coming out compared to the hundreds and thousands of milliwatts that you see today. But it was a step, and, and this step here uh, was something that was only about two millimeters in thickness. I, I had the opportunity to visit his lab in 1998 or 99, and essentially he had what looked like a cookie sheet, just this pan with a little rim about it that he rolled out his wet powders on, he slid it into something that looked like an oven, took it out, held it up, and it was a purple transparent sheet. Now it was only about two millimeters thick, but it was 99% usable. You had to cut off the outside because of the, the shrinkage and the stress effects. But he had a way to now take this large sheet of material and punch thousands of these little discs out to make micro lasers. Whereas with, if you were growing a single crystal, you're gonna have to core drill it, you're gonna have to slice it. He's growing this near net shape with a centering process. So very, very ingenious way to think outside of the box. And I said, how, how did you do that? And, and one of his lab assistants said, his daughter had an easy bake oven. Do you know what an easy bake oven is? Those little ovens with a light bulb as a kid, you slide something in and, and, and you cook it. That's what his idea was for making this, so. Now, there, there are challenges. I mean, it's not as easy as I just made it sound. And, and the real key challenges here are how to get rid of the pores because this is a, a grain boundary process, how to clean up those grain boundaries, and how to hold your powders on single phase. And if you can get through those major milestones, you can then move to a transparent material. One of the things that is a showstopper is birefringence in a material. Because this is transparency through a material, if you have different grains with a birefringent material, they're going to line up differently, which by Snell's law, you're going to have different indices of refraction, so the light's gonna bend differently, and you're gonna get a tremendous amount of scatter. You can get translucency at best, but you're never going to get low enough losses or transparent enough material to make a laser gain uh, material. So, the first thing you have to do is throw out ILF, yttrium vanadate, a lot of the materials that are uniaxial or biaxial. It's just a problem that you can't overcome because of the, the way the grain boundaries align themselves. Now there are some opportunities. Um, uh, Takanori Taira's group in uh, Japan has been working on using extremely large magnets and taking magnetic optical materials and trying to align them prior to doing the processing but you're looking at magnets that are NMR size magnets to optimize a powder that's 25 millimeters in cross section. So it's probably not a very highly commercial way of doing it, but they're working at it. But if you're doing it in a large slab format, it's gonna be difficult if you're using birefringent materials. Some of the materials that are cubic, that have been made transparent, YAG that we've talked about, yttria, scandia, lutetia, all the sesqua oxides, uh, aluminum oxynitride, alon, spinel, magnesium oxide, aluminum oxide combination, zinc sulfide, and then alumina leucolox uh, has also been made. It is rhombohedral, but the primary driver for the alumina is for the outside of the sodium vapor lamps. They need a very high temperature material to dissipate the heat, but it doesn't have to be laser quality. If it's transparent and can get the sodium vapor light out, then that's good enough for them and they can make it in a very inexpensive format. Some of the work you see here is from our partnering with Penn State where they grew a series of undoped, 1%, 3%, 5% neodymium. Um, these are actually, the darkness actually is not transparency of the material, it's actually the absorption of the neodymium. 
uh, and here's a, a corundum, which is the aluminum oxide you see here. So that's the level of transparency of the material that was first uh, being developed at Fraunhofer's group. As I mentioned, scattering is a problem. So birefringence, that one throws that out. There are other scattering areas, as you can see here. So some of the mechanisms that cause scattering in a polycrystalline material are grain boundaries. So if you have a grain boundary here, it's not aligned or it's a bad grain boundary, that can scatter your incoming photons. Inclusions or pores that get trapped within the grain. I'll show you photographs of all of these in a moment. Uh, secondary phase. YAG actually has three phases. You've got your garnet phase, a perovskite phase, and an M phase. If you get a mixture of phases in there, the light's gonna scatter at each of those different phases. You've got Fresnel losses at the surface. That's gonna happen with any difference in the index refraction, but you can also have double refraction at interfaces if they're not uh, aligned properly. And then finally, surface preparation. That can be solved through fabrication and polishing. All of the others come in through the manufacturing process. So what does that mean? Well, attenuation is scattering and absorption. Absorption you're gonna have in there unless you from the neodymium, but if you have other impurities, you're gonna get residual absorption from that. But you've also got pores, which are these little black dots that you see here. That can either come from your material being too rich in aluminum or too rich in yttrium, and inclusions that get trapped inside of the material. Uh, Romain Guillaume and Bob Beyer have been working on this for a number of years at Stanford. Uh, George Boulogne up at Lyon has also been working on this. But the real processing challenge is getting rid of the pores, keeping the grain boundaries clean. Uh, two of the photographs from Konoshima show this, which shows very, very nice grains, slightly different sizes. Uh, your bar down here is about five microns, so these are on the order of micron sized grains across. Um, but they're, they're lined up very nicely and they're clean interfaces. They've also done a, a, a grain boundary here where they've tried to, on purpose to move the material, and you can see that all of the boundaries line right back up again after they go to the interface, and they're trying to show that their processing allows them to do this, and I'll show more on this in just a minute. So as I mentioned, with YAG, you've got three different phases. You've got the garnet phase, which sits right here, the perovskite phase, and the M phase. So you have got to be exactly on stoichiometry here between the aluminum oxide and the yttrium oxide to hold it at a garnet phase. That's controlled by temperature. So when you're making your powders, you have to have just strong temperature stability. If you're growing the crystal, holding it away from those other phases is much, much more difficult because you can't have any temperature fluctuations because if you look over here, any kind of up or down on the garnet phase and you're gonna drive it to a different phase. With the powders, it's all done in the powder processing. The processing of those powders is critical. If you look here, you've got these secondary phases. These are the black dots that you see are regions where there wasn't enough aluminum in the mix to get it to all come in single phase. And then you've got these pores that are lined up on these very white portions of the, of the grain boundaries. This isn't tolerable in the manufacturing process. So a lot of the work that we spent doing this at our facility over about a 24 month time frame, we funded three graduate students PhDs to really understand what does it take to drive holding the yttrium and the aluminum ratios at the exact right stoichiometry, and what processes does it take to drive zero pores being incorporated into the processing steps, and uh, Adam Stevenson and several others published some very nice theses off of this. Well, that one didn't attach, so we'll skip it. Some of the early work that we did, uh, I did a paper back in 2005 our facility was growing uh, the largest amount of single crystal neodymium YAG uh, globally. Uh, there were about eight or nine facilities, including facilities in the Czech Republic, Japan, China, Russia, that were all growing YAG. And ours we took, and three other companies we took as a baseline, and we measured the scattering loss as a function of wavelength on argon lines between 477 and 515. And you can see here that the, the scattering losses were between one and 1 1.5 times 10 to the minus four. Um, after about three years of working with Konoshima, this was their scattering loss. It was a full factor of two lower than single crystal. So they had the ability to take this material, drop it into a laser, and have threshold drop by almost a factor of two in a commercial laser system overnight. 
and that makes a big difference when you're talking about running your diodes right at the edge of uh, burning out or trying to keep uh, your power supplies operational for a longer amount of time. You want to be able to dial back the amount of light coming out of those diodes as much as possible. And if you gain a factor of two because your Finley clay analysis shows that the losses are now lower, that's a, that's a big savings for the laser companies. In 2013, uh, Bayer and Goheim went back and looked at the same type of losses uh, using photothermal common path interferometry, PCI. It's essentially a ring down resonator. It's a very, very high Q cavity. You put very, very low loss material in, put a beam at one micron in, and you measure the losses that way. And what they were able to show was for undoped YAG and for neodymium YAG that you had opportunities for the uh, materials to uh, be in the same ballpark with what they were growing at Stanford. So all of these were very clean materials. This is the blue line across here for single crystal uh, aluminum oxide or corundum and down here single crystal or fused silica. So use those as a baseline point for calibration within the PCI system. But I think this is probably the most important slide uh, to really understand is that the fabrication improvement of, of ceramic YAG, that is the amount of loss in the material, really drives the ability to extract output power from the solid state laser. And the reason being is that it, the larger that you make these crystals, ceramic crystals, and the harder you pump them, if you have absorptive or scattering losses in the material, it's going to cause the beam to either thermally bloom out or thermally focus and damage the bulk gain material. So a good way to map out the quality is to map monitor laser output power as a function of losses. And what this chart shows is losses starting in 1985 down to almost 2010, dropping by almost four orders of magnitude and the laser output power from these samples of neodymium YAG going from down here at 10 milliwatts up to 10 to the fifth watts. So these two go hand in hand in driving the ability to generate high levels of output power out of a crystal. So again, going back and reviewing the manufacturing, for ceramic manufacturing, the slides that didn't pop up up there, you're actually doing the centering at about 1,790 degrees for two hours. For single crystal growth, you're at 1,970 degrees for 40 days. So time difference, turnaround, the ability to see if you're doing the process properly and manufacture something that can get onto the fabrication floor in your facility is greatly reduced here. Now there is a lot of chemical preparation that's not built in here, but it's about five days per large slab. So even at that point, if you add that in, it's a seven day process, starting in the powders to the end of the material versus 40, 41 days with single crystal growth. Um, maximum rod diameter is smaller because as you center these ceramics, it's all based upon um, diffusion of the heat out of the material during the centering process. And there's only so much that you can do and keep it single phase and let the heat be uniform through the material. So. Uh, last I saw it was right about 15 millimeters with good clean aperture. Uh, here, here's where it really starts building in. If you're building lasers where you need extremely high amounts of power, cutting, welding, automobile, military applications, the larger the piece of material, the larger the output power. And gain is a function of unit volume. So here, 50 by 200 by 15. Here, 300 by 300 by 15 were the maximum sizes of pure material that could be fabricated. Doping variation was about 30%. On the ceramic sizes across 300 millimeters, we measured um, doping variation of plus or minus one-tenth of one-hundredth of a percent. So at one end, it would be 1.001, and one end would be 1.000% neodymium in the material. So any kind of neodymium concentration-induced thermal gradient or optical distortion was not present in the ceramic. And the Konoshima group was able to get up to 9% neodymium in their material. There are several ways that uh, groups have found to manufacture. Conventional centering uh, has been one of them. I'll show you two of them side by side here. The Konoshima team is using chemical co-precipitation. They're starting with metal chlorides. It's a complex process that they go through. It's difficult to, to scale up. 
but they are demonstrating material with very high doping, zero pores, minimal pores, uh, very high quality, uh, that generated in laser rods over a kilowatt and a half very easily. Their grain size is about five microns or less. The world lab from uh, the case away uh, is just using oxide powders, making from alcohol oxides. It's a very straightforward path. It's pretty easy to make. You do use dry processing, vacuum center at 30 to 50 microns on the grains here. The only downside that I've seen is that the, the scattering losses don't get eliminated as rapidly in this material from the processing that's used. They're about the same as single crystal or a little bit worse. But for very thin disk where the losses aren't as incremental or as uh, deleterious, it's not a big deal. And so why nanopowders? Why do you want to keep these powders small? And the thing that's impressed me about the meeting so far is how many people have been working on nanopowders and various types of, of processing here. So you know that the sintering is driven by surface free energy of these particles coming in close contact to each other. Uh, it increases as the particle size decreases from the Kelvin equations. And the centering forces increase as the particle size decreases. So you know, somewhere between 0 0.1 and 0 0.01, millimeters, you can actually achieve very high density uh, materials at reasonably low temperatures. And as you can see here, uh, as you get the open pore porosity, it starts to drop down to essentially zero between 1250 and 1350 on titania. So uh, there have been studies done with this on YAG and other materials, and you see the same drop off on the curve. So getting it to the right size, driving the free energy, using the, ther the uh, uh, thermal mass of the heater, uh, you can make nice material with these nanopowders. Hmm. Okay, we'll skip that. Another way to, to make the powders besides the two you just saw here is the way that NanoSerox makes it uh, up in Detroit and several other groups do it. Um, it's a flame spray pyrolysis technique. And, and as I tell everybody, it's capturing smoke in a bag. You start with liquids, metal organic precursors. You blow that liquid into a furnace like this one, when it blows through there and is quenched later on, you get very fine, very uniform, 50 micron micro powders that are captured down here in your bagging house. Uh, you've gotta have the right level of processing taking place here, but it's an old tried and true technique. It's been used in many different types of uh, pyrolysis techniques. They've been able to accommodate it for nanopowders, for YAG and other transmissive materials. This is the facility at the Naval Research Lab. Uh, Jazz Sangara's group where they're doing powder preparation. They're using a hot press, a hot isostatic press. They just prepare the powders with high purity. They press them, they hip them to clear transparency. And it's a fairly inexpensive process. This whole set of gear is probably 300K uh, in the open market. And one of the other things that I want to talk about are there are some other advantages to ceramic. You can do tape casting, which I'll get to later. This is just wet ceramic that you can take and twist and bend. Uh, before it's been centered. You can slip cast, you can press the powders into near net shape. And that's really probably the, the, the greatest beauty of this is if you're making a geometry that's extremely complex, like a dome, if you make that out of sapphire, you're going to grow a very large piece of sapphire, usually with an HEM method. And then you're going to take a fabrication machine and you're going to hog that material out and you're gonna have 90% of it's gonna be lost in the fabrication process. And because it's sapphire, it's probably gonna take you several months to get it to the right shape. With the ceramics, you can take the powder, press it into that dome, and have a press on the top and the bottom, and it comes out. I'll show you this in a few steps here. This is the NRL work over a five-year time frame, going from 25 millimeter diameter up to 125, and then finally up to uh, over a third of a meter in cross-section of, of transparent spinel. So why is spinel important? Well, it's got a, a fairly nice visible transmission window here as well as mid-wave. So for doing FTIR from aircraft, for doing windows for uh, armored personnel type of devices, it's a good high quality material with an extremely good amount of strength. Uh, you can see here that the spinel does show better mid-wave transmission than both aluminum oxynitride and sapphire. And this kind of highlights it from a different perspective. Here's, uh, here's one of the, the Alon laminated windows. This is a regular window that comes out of a, 
a, a, an armored car or an armored uh, truck. Um, this weighs on the order of about 75 pounds, uh, just with regular glass with laminates between it. This is about 14 pounds. So if you're sitting in that armored car and you're driving, chauffeuring somebody around, you're not gonna be able to roll these windows down to get air into the vehicle. Uh, with this size, you can, and uh, this is what happens when you try a weapons impact on it with a 50 caliber. Uh, with the Alon, it doesn't break. It actually holds together in one piece and shatters, but doesn't shoot out. And this is what those domes look like that I was talking about that are pressed to that exact geometry and are able to be polished on the inside and the out in a matter of a few weeks. One of the other materials that's getting a, a tremendous amount of investigation currently uh, are the sesquioxide materials, uh, primarily a terbium dope sesquioxide. And, and the real reason is, is that it's right down here in the thermal conductivity. When you're pumping a laser material hard, you want to get the heat out. And the best way to do it is to have a good high thermal conductivity. And compared to something like YAG, it's 50% better thermal conductivity. So companies like Trumpf, who are make, manufacturing these thin disk lasers, want to have their laser piece as thin as possible and bring the heat out through the faces and the edges. And you can't do that very well with a large piece of YAG, but you can do it pretty nicely with these. Uh, the sesquioxides oxides were first grown back in the 60s at Bell Labs. Their melting temperature is about 2,300 degrees, uh, two to 300 degrees higher than YAG, and most furnaces at that temperature are breaking down. It's hard to hold a material and keep it from going volatile on you uh, at that kind of a growth temperature. So uh, the groups in uh, Germany and Hamburg have been able to grow pieces that are about the size of a thimble, and then it goes off course. So large pieces for industrial situations uh, aren't very readily available. And why, why put the ytterbium in? So for something like Scandia with the high thermal conductivity, here's the Scandia ionic radius, and here's ytterbium, and it matches up pretty well. It's not as bad as, as going up here to neodymium where you've got a, a much higher ionic mismatch. Here's the thermal conductivity measured by the various groups that you see up here. Here's Lutetia, Yttria, Scandia. This is as a con function of concentration of ytterbium. Here's glass down here, it's horrible. And there's YAG, which sits below all of them. So there's been a large drive in the last five years to really understand how to manufacture these type of materials in ceramic processing. And the other nice thing is too, is they're very efficient. As we showed previously with the quantum defect, for a terbium in a standard host, 80% is the maximum efficiency. And this group uh, at NRL has shown 74% efficiency with their terbium based materials. So they're getting Something on the order of 18 watts out for 25 watts in, and that's a, that's a pretty good exchange from going from a very broad, highly divergent diode beam to a very nicely uh, confined laser beam at 108 nanometers. I wanna recognize some of the other groups that I showed previously. The group at Clemson's been doing erbium doped yttria, uh, trying to develop new thin disc materials for dental applications. Uh, the red lines here are the f standard Fresnel losses, so they've been able to grow materials that match up well with uh, the standard bulk index refraction calculated from the Selmeyer equations. Um, Dr. Zhang's group, now that's at Singapore, has done you know, gadolinium, neodymium, ytterbium, holmium, thulium, samarium, and erbium, all in YAG. They've done a number of other materials, too, with a facility that very much mimics what's taking place with the Navy. This was the material we were growing previously when I was at uh, 26 and VLOC. This is 300 millimeters of slab size. Uh, this is part of it polished up over the top of a business card, very highly transparent. And then one of the other unique properties about the ceramics, uh, you're able to bond similar materials to the ceramics in the green process while the powders are still wet. Um, th this is a 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 11 millimeter slab of neodymium YAG uh, made by Konoshima. They've also taken and put a 10 millimeter band of samarium doping all the way around it as an ASC, Amplified Spontaneous Emission Suppressor. So in those big lasers at Livermore, they can substitute these plates in now of Konoshima ceramic YAG. And what they did was they took the, the purple plate with the neodymium and the samarium plate in a wet form put them together, put them in the furnace simultaneously, heated them up, cooled them down, and it came out as one uniform piece. Uh, prior to this type of technology, you would have had to do diffusion bonding, which meant take this piece and polish it, get you know, sub-angstrom flatness on all these edges, 
polish the samarium to subanction flatness, put it in, heat it up, cool it down, and it's about a 24 week process. So running that through a production cycle isn't very efficient. This is what the laser looks like at Livermore in one profile on the beam. It's actually very, very clean. These are the high power diodes pumping these slabs from the side. And that's what happens in seven seconds when you take the beam out. You go through a 2.5 centimeter thick piece of steel in seven seconds. So it's not one you want to put your hand in front of to see if it's lazing yet or not. So to wrap it up here, I'm going to show you a few other applications. There are defense applications for this, obviously. Uh, three different geometries that are being used globally. Uh, the heat capacity laser you just saw from the Livermore, stack these plates up, generate you know, about 20 kilowatts per plate out. An end pump slab laser where you bring your diode light in, comes down here, exits or pump from both ends. And then a regular zigzag slab that you've probably learned about in your optics classes. Uh, we started working back in 2008 on a system for the uh, US Navy to develop a laser to go onto a ship to be tested. And this was the laser that was finally packaged by two different laser companies. And coming out of it was over 100 kilowatts in a 1.2 M squared type of a beam at one micron. Uh, and that's diodes, coolant, power supplies, everything is in this one rack that's uh, four foot by six foot. Wheel it onto a ship and shine it out of the port. Um, coming back to the one of the slides I was showing previously, power increase over a year. Here's 100 kilowatts. Northrop Grumman and Textron have both exceeded that. Livermore is now up to 90 kilowatts. So power is increasing rapidly. Uh, companies like Trump, Yen Optic, other companies like that are starting to incorporate these materials into their commercial laser systems uh, so that they can be used for cutting, welding, via hole drilling, stents for arterial applications. I'll leave the, the slides here with Jonas. Uh, there's a couple of pretty interesting videos, and we don't have time to go through these, but uh, there's one where the Navy, with this laser standing off a few kilometers away from a boat with two outboard motors on it, they turn the laser on and catch the outboards on fire within a matter of a few seconds. And you think, okay, so why, why is that important? Well, it was developed when there was a lot of conflict going off the coast of Somalia, and the pirates were coming up and trying to raid ships and sail boats and other things going up and down the coast. And, it, it, from a policy standpoint, it's not good to shoot people on another boat. So what can you do that's the least damaging, the least invasive, and incapacitate their means of transportation? And the first video shows them setting the two outboard motors on fire. And it's just a matter of standing off a few kilometers away where they can't get to you, focus the beam on there, use your infrared viewer, a few seconds on the outboard motor, fuel ignites and the whole thing catches on fire. You know, you get off the boat, it sinks, whatever, but you're not having to use a, a weapon or something to uh, hurt somebody and uh, face all the bad press that comes with that. And then, and then the other thing, there was uh, some work that was published in Canada and the UK, I think on BAE, using some of these lasers to take out uh, drones and surveillance systems in mid-flight. So they're, uh, they're becoming more prevalent out there, and, and that was the whole goal of a lot of these high-power devices. But one of the interesting things that it led us to at NanoSerox and one of the other companies was, if we can make laser materials and make them very high purity, there have to be other cubic materials that we could make that can contribute. And, and there's been a, a wealth of information coming out of scintillator-based ceramics. And these ceramics are now going into the three largest PET scanners being manufactured globally. And, I, I think the most important thing is, is the cost of the materials going into those PET scanners are down by almost 200x by using the ceramics because you can make them so much more efficiently, you can make them in high volumes, and you say, okay, well, you know, is 200x really a big deal? Well, if you're trying to put a PET scanner in sub-Saharan Africa where you've got power issues and not a lot of country wealth, it makes a huge difference because now you're getting companies to where they can manufacture equipment at a lower cost that can be used and accessed by more of the global population. And all of this was based off of the initial work driven by Konoshima and the Japanese government and the initial work driven by the uh, US Department of Defense. And it's, uh, it's really coming along very nicely. You're getting very, very large slabs of, of, of BGO and various uh, cerium and europium doped oxides uh, in the scintillator arena. Another area that you may not know about, 
Smart gear, okay, so we heard yesterday about Apple was looking at Sapphire, that went down, it didn't work. They're cutting Gorilla Glass now for this. But in working with companies like Samsung and Apple, the smart watches are the next big thing. But this is a $600 watch, 600 euro watch. And guess what? More people will hit their watch on the corner of a desk than's gonna hit their cell phone, which means that as soon as you hit that piece of glass, you're gonna break it. Second, third, or fourth time, it's gonna weaken it if it's Gorilla Glass, and you're probably not gonna be happy investing 600 euros in that and not be able to wear it for a month or two. So those companies are wondering, how do we make a ceramic material that's much stronger than glass that can be made near net shape, 120 microns thick, and pre-polished on the edge, and make them 10,000 an hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that's what they're looking at. So they're looking at taking some of the oxynitrides and some of the spinels and making them via centering of ceramics in very thin flat sheets, dicing and going, and trying to drive the cost of this watch down from $600 to $200, so then it's in the same range as your cell phone, but much stronger and much less public negative reaction from it breaking very rapidly. And then finally, uh, there are a tremendous amount of opportunities in engineered materials that were never available when I was doing my research as a student. Trying to take and, and change concentrations by doing uh, manufacturing with transparent uh, ceramics. So engineering slabs with different dopant profiles so that you're matching up to the cavity mode and the pump mode of your diodes. Manufacturing embedded materials that have very high doping in the middle and undoped material around the outside like you see here. So your beam, when it goes in and follows Beer's law, is gonna be absorbed uniformly in the center of the material and not depleted before it gets to the main portion of the gain region of your laser material. Uh, this work coming out of uh, Stanford is actually stacking powder components so that you got real low concentration on both ends and high in the middle. After you center it, it actually comes out very uniform from XRD type of studies. They've also looked at the thermal management. Look how high this thermal lensing starts taking place here. You just start to get a tremendous amount of distortion and very high blooming. When you change and go to the gradient doping, you see very, very little white in there and definitely not any up here in the area where most of your pump beam is being absorbed. So there are ways to engineer these materials to be much more efficient and put out better beam quality. And again, it all goes back to this tape casting making these very thin, wet tapes of material with one doping and then stringing another one and set it on, on top with a little bit higher doping and higher and higher, stack it up, put it in the furnace, heat it up, cool it down, take it out, and now you've got a gradient forced end to end. And then this is one that came out of Gary Messing's group with different dopants of erbium to try to stay away from the green up conversion process that takes place. So in conclusion, over the last 15 years, a lot of work has taken place and it's taken place across a very multidisciplinary group of individuals. And the, you know, the main focus here is stay focused on what you're doing, find people that can work with you and develop technologies like this. Through a couple of quotes in here at the end, the quote by Stephen Hawking that I like so much is, you know, be curious, stay curious all the time. Okay, that's what's going to get you ahead in the world, especially in the scientific world. And then this one, especially in the industrial world, and I find it, as a scientist, I find it really hard to fail because most everybody in here was at the top of your class in high school, the top of your class in college, and you're not gonna fail. But to have failure as a possibility sucks. And it really makes you sometimes wanna be more conservative than you need to be. So the main thing is, from the playwright Samuel Beckett and Richard Branson quotes it all the time, ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better. Steve Jobs used to say, fail fast, fail often. Look at something, try it, if it doesn't work, toss it, learn from it, and go on to something else. And then finally, if you don't ever try to, if you don't ever, if you worry about failing too much, you're never gonna succeed. So I'm gonna encourage you to go out and try different things, think outside of the box, look at your life as you move forward in science, and try things that people say, now that can't be done, and go out and prove them wrong. And if you fail, guess what? It's just a data point and you throw it in there and you go back and you do something else. So those are probably the two key main messages to take away. Ceramics, they're there, but that's what I'd like for you to hear. So as students, thank you for giving me the time to talk to you and for inviting me to come over and, and share with you, and thank you. Thank you so much for such an interesting yes. and optimistic uh, talk. And
We knew well uh, that for millennia, uh, ceramics is uh, the best material for making pots. And yes. he nearly convinced us that that's the best material for making lasers. Uh, we are nearly uh, out of time, but uh, um, I suggest to use uh, the opportunity of having you here and ask some uh, short questions. Please. Yes. Do you think that uh, this ceramic material is going to eventually replace crystals and solid state lasers completely? You know what, I, th I think that the challenge is going to be are fibers going to get you there first? Because the ceramics were developed before IPG and all these other companies came into the forefront of making high power systems. You know, back in 1998, the, you know, a, a one kilowatt fiber laser, you know, had the breadth of a flashlight. You could shine it from here to the back wall and lose most of the photons. Now they're learning to do coherent beam coupling and make things very efficient. So I, I think the ceramics will be used in the thin disk applications, certainly, for high beam quality, very thin real estate areas. I think fibers may overtake the 100 kilowatt systems in the long run just because of efficiency, compactness, robustness, things like that. So I think fibers are the way, but there are people that are working on ceramic types of fibers where they're actually pulling ceramics in different geometries that, that mimic some of these uh, works that are coming out of Southampton. So I think keep an eye on that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, please? Uh, one of the uh, parameters uh, estimating the merit of optical uh, materials is the optical damage. I mean, laser optical damage, uh, <clears throat> which is uh, caused by cell focusing or other phenomena. So could you comment uh, this for the polycrystalline materials? Yes. Ceramic yeah, there, there, there have been uh, several good papers written on that. We did some work on it back in 2005 and 6, and we found that number one, the, the mechanical strength of the ceramic is actually higher than single crystal, because single crystal has point defects that cause under flexure the material to break more rapidly. The optical surface damage, um, the ceramics are equivalent if not slightly higher, a few percent, less than 10% higher than single crystal. It all is focused on the, well, from the thermal standpoint, significantly better. From the surface standpoint, with the ceramics and the grain boundaries, you have to make very sure that your surfaces are extremely clean during the polishing process. You don't want ceramic oxide burying down into the, the grain boundaries and causing there to be absorption at the surface. If you stay away from that, that they are as good as single crystal from a surface damage standpoint. And I can share, I can send you those papers if you'd like. Thank yes. Thank you. One more question. Uh, you, sintering relies on the reduction of uh, melting point at interfaces. And uh, I remember slightly you, you, you added some additives actually in the sinter process. There was the reactive. Uh, yes. Approach. And how do these, uh, I think, alkaline metals, how do they behave and how do impurities uh, uh, accumulate in the interfaces and how does this affect the optical properties? Because it's, it's really not trivial, I feel. Well, it, it, it's not trivial, but it's elegantly simple. The, the additives that they found that work best are silicon based additives, TEOS that just happens to have a melting and evaporation point at about 800 degrees. So what it does is it drops that surface energy temperature first, then as you heat, as it draws in those grains, it evaporates out. So as long as you're using high purity to EOS, it's gone by the end of the process. So it's, it, it's a beauty. Gary Messing and his team have done two or three publications on that and they've, they've done it and analyzed it very, very well. No, I think the, if, you, if you look at the two side by side, the regular crystal growth and, and the ceramic, from the time you start cutting and polishing 
it's almost identical. So all of your costs there are going to be the same. The real cost is the savings in the power, the savings in the preparation, the much higher yields, and the ability to grow material that you're not gonna be throwing away. So those big slabs that you saw in there that go into these military systems, they were you know, physically grown 300 by 300 and just sliced out and the ends polished. If you'd have done that with a bull, you'd have had to cut out, throw away. So your real savings are on geometries that are hard to manufacture from a single crystal standpoint or dopants that are in there. Other than that, once you start polishing, they're gonna polish the same, they're gonna coat the same. So those costs are gonna be a wash. Good question though, thank you.